Welcome back to this episode of Uncover the Human. Today, it's just Christina and I, and we're going back to one of our favorite topics, change. So we've uh, <laughs> recently gotten to see so much changes happening, obviously, over the summer. There's so many companies going to RTO. There was a lot of different layoffs at the beginning of the summer. There was fears of economic, I don't know, recession that never really panned out. And then other yeah. other just general worries. And of course, that is all on top of any regular organizational change that happens all the time for everybody always. So we kind of wanted to revisit this topic because there's a lot of things we've noticed that we think we can help illuminate and put some light on what, what might be some best practices. Or at least, you know, at the very least vent about what we see. Which is also an important part of change. It is, <laughs> Letting yes. people vent. Venti about what we see that we know it's not going to work. It's a big part of change. Oh, man, where to start on this? So mm. there's so much that goes into change. Let's just start with the the top top level. Change is happening all the time. Humans are used to the idea that change will be happening all the time, but that doesn't mean that it's actually comfortable. And our brains are always looking for reasons to kind of stay at the status quo and not move the needle and not go too far into discomfort because it takes a lot of extra mental processing power to go change everything up. Even though, as we all know, everything is changed all the time and everything changes all the time and all of our plans change all the time. I'm going to go stop by Starbucks. No, wait, this one's closed. Oh, no, there's a giant line at this one. Whatever it is. I mean, there's there's a dozen little things that can change on top of the large changes that are created within companies. Yeah. Yeah. I think that having our own awareness as as with everything, we start by, you know, picking up the mirror, going into our mirror room, crazy Halloween looking mirror room where we always see <laughs> ourselves and really needing to understand how do we go through change? How do we experience change? What helps us? What doesn't help us? Uh, and, and then how do we humanize change? I think we've, you know, we've t- always talk about humanizing the workplace. I think humanizing change is probably on the t- top three lists of how you humanize a workplace. Yes, change happens all the time. We go through change all the time. And that doesn't give anybody the power to downplay it and say, well, it's just another change. Yes. You should be used to this. And I just used just and should in the same sentence. Talk about flags. Yeah. Those are two big flags that are easy to fall into when we say it's just this. Like, we're just doing it can be something, and we've heard this stated, anything from like, oh, we're just changing our CRM to, oh, we're just going to restructure the entire organization. Like, okay, I, mean, I get why you'd want to say that as like a contained thing, but that is, those are both monumental shifts, which have all kinds of little ancillary ripple effects. It's never just anything. And so anytime anybody's throwing out a just, there's usually a lot of detail missing in the offing. Yes. And I would say... If I were trying to guess of why we use the word just and change, it is to try and minimize it, is to try and minimize the disruption because we know the disruption is going to cause tons of ripple effects. It's going to cause a, low, a lowering of productivity, of engagement. It's going to cause conflict, resistance, confusion. And so all those things that we try to avoid as much as possible because they're not pleasant. We think that by using the word just, we actually make them less than what they are. And I actually believe that the effect is the opposite because all it does, it it shows that there's no apparent regard for the impact, all the impacts of the change. Yes. Yeah. And when people see it as a just, like first there's all the questions that they have unanswered that are left out there, which then becomes like, it feels like it's minimized or they shouldn't have those questions or somehow that has already been thought about and it it shouldn't be their concern. These are all uh, big red flag words too. Every time you say should, shouldn't, shouldn't be this, shouldn't do that. There's, these are the ways that people prevent people from asking questions. Even if as a leader, you have decent intentions of trying to like mitigate the idea of like this is going to be massive and everybody should should panic now when you start with that just you're ignoring a lot of things that people are caring about and there's things that you won't know about you we all only have our point of view and it's inherently going to have its own limitations that's fine that's natural that will happen for all of us but then it becomes incumbent upon us especially in leadership positions to be be more curious about what those impacts are and try and get other voices involved so we can fill out that point of view a little bit more we'll still discover things on the way but 
no thinking that we have the full picture or enough of the picture is usually not true until we've done a lot of exploration. Indeed. It also provides, it shows a lack of empathy, honestly. Mm -hmm. Using the word just shows a huge lack of empathy, which it is the number one way to alienate buy-in and actually guaranteed you don't get buy-in. Uh, I think it's used to be able to move on and get buy-in and it's the opposite. It's a straight guarantee that you're not going to get buy-in because there, there's no showing of empathy. And I have a, I just thought about, I just thought about a different kind of what? just on that case that was, yeah, exactly. that was time <laughs> don't want to take the word just out of the dictionary it's just <laughs> we just don't want to use it in the right way and apparently i can't stop using it so one example that i thought about on my own mirror talk about the mirror like you know like okay like how about put the mirror up and you know go into the room go into the fun room and and explore is with my son actually he's He's in middle school and he's in that age where, for some reason, <laughs> clothing manufacturers decided that there's no size, there's a gap. So you can get pants for a 10 to 12 year old, which is a huge span for one size, by the way, because a 10 year old is a foot shorter than a 12 year old in most <laughs> cases when they're boys. And so you're already struggling with that because there's no way those pants are actually going to fit for two years. But then there is no 12 to 14 size. It goes to 14 to 16. So now your choices are you're either wearing, you know, clown pants that come up to your calves <laughs> and are super tight, or you're swimming in the next size up and there's nothing <laughs> in between. And so my poor son has been struggling with that because, you know, of the, of the sizing issues. And as the weather gets colder, he, he now has to wear pants. Now, shorts are easier to, to, to navigate in that. Shorts, you can roll up, you know, they're short, so they can be a little bit longer, a little bit shorter, you, you know, it's, it's okay. Yeah, you're not going to get enrolled in the circus. And, but pants becomes a problem. And he's, you know, he's, it's been an emotional couple of days of having to wear pants because none of his pants, you know, fit well. Some are too short and the other ones are too big or whatever is going on. Uh, and I, I, as a parent, you know, we're, we're going to be traveling. And so my, my why is I just need pants. I just need you to be wearing pants. I just need you to be wearing pants. I don't care how you feel in them. I don't care what they look like. They just, you know, as long as you don't look like a total clown, you just need to <laughs> wear pants. And because that was my expectation, I lost all empathy for what he was going through. And the fact that we all like to wear clothing that we find that we fit well in. Like it's a big part of what influences our performance is the clothing we wear. It has to be comfortable. We need to be comfortable in them. We need to, you know, at least feel that we're looking good and we can do what we want in them and, and move. And I totally disregarded that about him because I had my goal, which my goal is like, I just need pants for the suitcase. Don't care what they look like on you. Until, you know, I, I thought about it this morning. I was like, wait, what if I actually showed empathy? What if I actually understood where he's coming from? And it's not just pants because it wouldn't be just pants for me. What if I, and I put myself in there, like, what if I were just forced to wear pants that I find completely uncomfortable? It's like, I would close myself in the house and honestly stay in bed. Or if I, you know, or wear, well, I'm a woman, so I can wear skirts, skirts. you know, but even then it's like, it would be a huge deal for me. How pants feel, it's a huge deal for me. So why can't it be a huge deal for him? And that's when I shifted. And we talked about what kind of pants he likes to wear the most and what do they look like and what he doesn't like about the pants that he has besides the length. It's also the style. And now that I understand what he's looking for, as soon as I'm done working today, I'm going to drive around all the shops that I can find in three hours to find options for him that will make him feel comfortable. I think it's, first of all, uh, I just want to comment that that's a great like chain of focusing on change and a very easy trap to fall into of like, no, I need this goal done. Like you, you wearing pants is my goal. So just get some <laughs> pants on. That's, that's easy to do as leaders. We're like, I just need you to just, just please just do this. Like that's, that's still, this is the goal. But then you found like that, the empathy space of like, okay, so for, if I was in the shoes like this, this is probably what I'd be feeling. I can see why that would be a big deal. I can see why that would be 
uncomfortable and that leads to curiosity of like okay so what would be the right thing now you're co-creating what the actual change is going to be I mean, it's a great it's a great uh, tale just of of a common cycle that we see that really only gets broken the second you enter that empathy cycle and you can finally get into the new groove of okay now i feel what they're feeling let's get into mm-hmm. what what can we do about this like okay so you feel like there's a you know in the workplace i have you, you feel like your your department's work is being cut in half or changed or pulled, put to somebody else's department okay so what would be a good solution how do you what like here's what we're, here's our vision for your department that that actually has other responsibilities in these areas and here's why that's important whatever it is or getting just empathetic for like yeah i can see why that would be difficult and so what would be the what would be helpful to kind of make this transition knowing we want need to make we need to get to the pants on legs outcome that we're going <laughs> yes, for pants on legs comfortable <laughs> Pants on legs, and that's not it. Now my outcome has changed, and th- this is where the shift. Where's this is where when you, when you recognize you're just, and you switch it with an empathy response, then you, my goal has shifted. My goal is no longer he needs to be wearing pants. It's just about pants. My goal is now I want him to be comfortable and happy with what he's wearing for the next four months at this point because it's going to be cold weather for the next four months. And at the very least for the next week while we're traveling. Mm-hmm. So how can I accomplish that goal? As a side note, it's a little extra salt in the wounds that they don't happen to have pants sizes for the one time of life where you just like plunge into self-consciousness immediately. Like it's, it's a great time to not have, <laughs> not have just the basics of fitting clothes. Like the timing is impeccable. It's like puberty and middle school. That's when you make the pants the problem. Seriously. Go a whoever makes these problem. decisions. <laughs> also, how do you go from like basically a month by month size between the age of zero and four? And then you just lump sizes and ages into one size. Like, yeah, a 14-year-old and 16-year-old, same thing. And I'm like, really? Have you seen a 14-year-old next to a 16-year-old? <laughs> Oh, God. Unbelievable. That's a great example of a change, though, and and getting through that. like Because it it's also a good example of, like, there's not a going back to this. It's not like you can even remain in the previous pant size. That's no longer viable. So there has to be something new. So now, like, yeah, back to the, the end goal might be pants on legs. But what do we then do to get to that? And what does it really mean? Like, what kind of pants would be would be most encouraging to get the pants on legs outcome you're looking for? And that actually brings us to something else we discuss a lot, which is thinking about the human why behind what you're saying, right? Like your your goal may be getting pants on legs, uh, and the human why is I want you to, I want you to be comfortable in pants so that you have yes. you know pants for the winter. And now, now it becomes more of a okay. So, what will get to that change? That 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 pants on legs might be considered like the the business reason, mm-hmm. and the human the human why is more like here's what this is going to do for you. You're going to yes. be warm. You could be comfortable. You could be like ready for winter. You there's no longer a viability of wearing shorts for the next seven months while you're at school. So, <laughs> yeah. indeed, and it's huge because if I actually think about the non-human why that I had, it wasn't even pants on legs. Like I couldn't care less if he had pants on legs. My why for all of this was I need to pack a suitcase so that it's ready in 48 hours. (laughs) And I need to know which pants go in the suitcase. So it had nothing to do with him. It had nothing Mm. to do with the human. Which, yes, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm getting called for the mom of the year award this afternoon. I think you're going to have a lot of sympathetic people that, that have had exactly this kind of argument, whether it's coats, jackets, whatever. Like It doesn't even have to be about garments, but I'm sure this is a very relatable struggle of like, no, can we just, I, okay, there's a thousand things I need to plan on this trip. Can you just get some pants that will go in a suitcase? Like, And that brings up the other part of empathy, right? Like we have our we have our reaction to it. We know what we need to get done. And we know the other 50,000 things that need to get done, which can lead us to be pretty impatient with the things that, uh, are just feel feel minor, or we we don't have the haven't had the time to sit down and have the empathy mm-hmm. for that portion. And you see how the conversation entirely changes the second you got to that empathy portion of the pants one. But that of course comes with the natural seesaw of balancing time that you have to get all the other things done that go into getting a trip together. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes. 
Definitely. And one of my favorite recent quotes is, you know, leaders make time for change or change will take time from you. That's also what I'm experiencing. If I had actually stopped resisting not getting to my objective as fast as possible in the way that I expected it to be, I could have actually gone shopping with my son this week or last weekend to figure out pants that he would be feel comfortable with and would fit because this pants thing has been going on for a couple of weeks. This is not yesterday we found out that his pants don't 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 actually fit well. I've just been minimizing it as a thing because it's like, well, it's not a thing. They're just pants. Mm-hmm. You know, just you should just you know they look great. Just be fine. Another phrase that goes along great with middle schoolers. Just be fine with it. <laughs> uh, and so now, as I said, now the change, because I didn't make time for the change when it was actually happening a few weeks ago, now the change is taking time from me. And instead of packing and doing other things, I will be driving around malls for endless hours. Yeah. And so time has been made or taken, <laughs> depending on how you, time how has you been taken. look at it. Yes. <laughs> Clarity on that really helps. And it is a two-way street, right? Because in an organization and in life and with your family and with your friends and with whoever else you're talking to, like there's there's going to be, there's always some resistance to change just on the face of like, yeah, why I didn't want, especially if you like suggest a change to somebody else. They're like, well, I mean, I was doing fine. Like, I don't really mm-hmm. want to put this extra effort in. Or, oh man, that's going to really disrupt something that's going on for me. And so this, there ends up being like, I think that's one of the reasons that's such a true phrase that if you, if you don't make time for change, time will be taken from you. Because if you, if you try and minimize it, if you try and just push something through, you're just going to find all of the extra other ways that resistance shows up. You can try and force a change, but the resistance is going to happen one way or another. Either you can be open with it, at which point people will, you have the ad benefit of now people feel like they're listened to, there's greater respect, there's a chance to like actually have your viewpoints heard and feel like it's not just going to get like forced on you whenever the next change happens. So you have that benefit, even if it takes a little bit less time or more time to get through the change, which is an ironic way of looking at it because either way you're going to go through that amount of time. It's yes. just whether you want there to be emotional turmoil in it or not. <laughs> yes, yeah. That's 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 the falsehood of the time it takes to change. There's somehow some miracle idea uh, out there in most in most uh, organizations that as people that have worked in change for way too many years at this point, uh, we've seen over and over is that if you have a plan and in the plan, the change says like the change is going to end on this date, that that's when the change is going to end. And... <laughs> The, the ironic part is that, first of all, I can guarantee you that data is wrong to begin with, even if the, everything went to plan, because that date typically is the go live date or the the date where all the restructuring is on paper uh, or, you know, from a, from an organizational point of view uh, or, or, you know, or even worse, when the when the change is communicated, when the new tool is 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 ready. And that is far from the end of the change. In most cases, that, uh, you know, it's that's really much closer to the beginning of the change. And so when you look at the change is actually done, you can call the change done if we want to do that, if we want to say that when the new status quo, so let's take pants. So when the new pants are not only the right size, the right fit, have been used, washed, and proven to be comfortable, but we're moving on to the next size of pants. And so we have now fully lived in the new behavior of the pants. That's when the change is done. And so when the status quo is fully adopted and we no longer remember the old status quo, that's when the change is done. Yes. Yeah, that's a great way of looking at it. When that status, when the the feeling of status quo, not the status quo, but when the feeling that things are, are default now. Yes. That's when the change has occurred. Like when you yes. when you initiate a change, you're starting the process of thinking about, hey, here's what's going to need to happen. Here's what's going to need to change. Here's why we want to do it. You have to go flesh all these things out deeply. You start to actually get into that implementation of it. And of course, it's 
pushing people in, in uncomfortable ways and nobody's ready for it. And there's some people who will feel like there's a loss or feel like there's something that they're particularly resisting or they just didn't want to do another change or tired from the last change, whatever it is, all of that is going to go into the process of going through that change. And you're not really done with the change until things feel settled and more, again, like a status quo, not the previous status quo, but a new status quo has been established and it's feeling comfortable and default. This is now how we operate. Yes. You know, and unfortunately, and here's another post that I saw recently that was just pretty hysterical. It was, it was a cartoon with one of those signs that usually are, are used in manufacturing companies that say like, it's been, you know, whatever, a hundred days of no incidents of, of no incidents. But this one had, a sign, they said like, it's been 17 days since our last reorganization. And the reason why it's funny is because it's true. We don't, so there's so many times where we don't wait for the change to have been completed. We don't wait for the new status quo to be the default. And we don't get the results that we expected at the beginning of the change or at the speed that we expected. Most of the times because the results were not clearly stated. So everybody's marching towards a different goal because the measures of success was not clear. And also, and by clear, it was not clearly validated that everybody was on the same page. And so then you're like, well, that didn't work. Let's try it all over again. I'm like, but you don't know if it works because you didn't give it enough time. Yeah. Or support or buy-in or all the pieces that have fell through the traps. The, the first image that came to my mind, and this is a, a weird example, but I just got my sprinklers blown out. So I guess that's why it's somewhat near the top of my mind. But the like when you turn your sprinklers on for the season, right? Like the you you like it sounds like an on-off switch, basically. You know, you just like flip the switch, turn the water back on, you know, turn the uh turn your cycles back on. You can, I guess, reprogram and change your timers if you need to, but ultimately you open that valve, there's now water, you can go spray it with the sprinklers. There's that time though between flipping the switch and all of the air that you carefully blasted out so you don't freeze your pipes last winter. All that air has to go escape, sputter, start. Like I think what happens a lot in change is we like, okay, we turned on the water. You go rushing outside and you see a sprinkler head going, pop, 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 <laughs> like dying and, and sputtering. And they're like, oh God, well, turn it off. This isn't working. Change the change. Let's go have, let's just put in new sprinklers. Yes. Like, but if you waited, you'd, you <laughs> would eventually just have flowing water regularly through your sprinklers. You have to give it that time for that adjustment yes. period. And this obviously on sprinklers, that's a much less frequent one. And then people are like, well, what if the change isn't working? Well, to go back to the sprinkler analogy, okay, sometimes you turn that on and then there's a geyser of water because one of your sprinkler heads was run over by a, a lawnmower or something. Like, yeah, you then have to stop, go fix yeah. that one and keep going like that. That, But those are the different kinds of issues and conflating the two isn't helpful where we, we haven't given it enough time versus no, that actually is a problem we need to slow down for. Yes. Oh, we need to change again. Get, get a whole new yes. sprinkler system or, you know, call a new guy to turn them back on because the, the old guy clearly didn't know what he was doing. And in this <laughs> metaphor, this is a rotating cast of consultants, I assume. <laughs> call the next Yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> Yes, in my metaphor in the workplace, that's usually a different consultancies <laughs> that, that get to do that. But that's the piece. Like, first of all, do we understand the measure of success? Do we have a clear vision of what the future it will be like? Right? What is the experience that we want to have in the future? Well, the experience in the sprinklers is we want all the sprinklers to come up, you know, sp spray around for the determined amount of time that we decided on the days that we decided and then shut down. And we want the water to actually go to all the spots in the yard and not puddle up. That's it. Are we all on the same page? So the measure of success is not we turn the sprinklers on. We call the guy. That's not the measure of success. The measure of success is the experience of grass being green. Yes. Yes. Because you could turn your sprinklers on and then have them blasting into the street. <laughs> exactly. And your grass is still dying. And so what are you going to do? Blame the grass? <laughs> Actually, probably you're going to blame the grass and replace the grass. Yeah, you're like, well, I guess we resawed this year. And Which so in now, that metaphor is layoffs, I guess. <laughs> yes. Metaphor is layoffs. And, so, and, you know, and I'm a big fan of another quote. Today is quote day. It's Friday. <laughs> so <laughs> I will say very little that's original. I've read. 
<laughs> and my another quote is like, when the flower doesn't grow, and we do this with plants all the time, and it's like, we don't blame the flower and replace the flower. We actually figure out what the environment's problem is. Why don't we do that with humans in workplaces? Why is there a constant <laughs> replacing and moving of humans and not a mirror on the environment and what we're creating and why we're not growing, the humans are not growing where they need to be? I saw some... I saw some TikTok or, or Instagram or something that was like the, along the same lines as this guy, like uh, with a half dead house plant that he put in the shade. And he's like, I'm putting this in a very tough environment because it needs to grow up to be stronger, just like I was taught. <laughs> like, oh, it's not going to work. <laughs> You're just in the wrong place. This plant's not going to make it. It's not going to be able to make chlorophyll outside of the sunlight. Yes. But yeah, somehow we forget that about humans. Yes. Yeah, because they're the just environments numbers. more complicated. The needs are more complicated. But the yes and no. We just don't get curious about it. <laughs> yes. Yeah. We don't pause yeah. to have enough time to have the curiosity yeah. about what environment would be better. Yeah. Yeah. I would. I would. I would venture to say, and this is just a guess, that humans are more complicated. A bit. And they're unwilling to just die <laughs> when they're in the wrong environment. A plant yeah. is like, well. I can't do anything about this. So there, there goes my life. Uh, That's really your measure I, of complexity on that. Because I have a really hard time keeping plants alive. Whereas I have yet oh, to I, run I a horrible. human off a cliff. <laughs> I'm horrible with plants. And apparently I'm not great with kids either. So I've got a long way to go. I think one pant story is probably not indicative <laughs> of an entire parenting. Hopefully. <laughs> If we want to, if we go back to our pants, pants on legs, which is how we now establish and talk about change, it's you know the the part that was missing in my empathy gap of the whole situation was getting my son's input, which happens, I would say, I would venture to say a hundred percent of the time. Nothing is absolute, so can we give ninety nine point nine nine to infinity? I know. At, you know, of the times in workplaces, it, it is very, very frequent, way too frequent that decisions are made about the change at the top. And I hate using the word top, but, you know, at a at, at different level, uh, at the decision makers level. And, you know, for them, it's just a little, like, little tweak. I mean, that's your job, really. I mean, what else do you do as a senior leader? You just look at things and you're like, oh, that's not working. Let's make an adjustment. Oh, that's not, not working. Let's make an adjustment. And they're tiny little adjustments because at the end of the day, that's all you're doing all day long is looking for what works and what doesn't work and adjusting what doesn't work. At the bottom, that's just, you're just nauseous and in a tsunami in a constant <laughs> place. And so for some reason, there's this fear, and I had it too with the pants on legs, to actually ask for what the person that has to go through the change, because it's not my pants, it's his pants. I don't have to worry about that. I've got comfortable pants. I don't wear non-comfortable pants. I donate them or don't buy them. And so it's not my pants, it's his pants. And so he's his experience. And I kept failing to ask to actually co-create the change with them, to say like, hey, what would you like to have here? Let me get your opinion of what you feel comfortable with and what you think looks good on you as opposed to what I think you should be wearing because it's what we have. Mm -hmm. That's a great way of uh, stating it. And it's, it is a good point of empathy for like what leaders go through in that like it, it's common and natural to kind of lose lose maybe the, the ability to immediately have that curiosity. It's a good reminder to kind of continue to go back to it and a reminder that it's until it really, really, really is too late. It's not too late. Like it's not too late to go back and say these things. And it's also fine that it, if it wasn't something you initially addressed with your change, but you realize that this is now causing massive chaos and you'd like to address it, it's not too late to go re-extend that and, and work to go rebuild those relationships and that trust of like, oh, no, I am I am looking out for you. I, I do. I, I want to have empathy for what you're going through rather than having some of that avoidance. And it's fair also to know that you're going to have just natural avoidance to that and like oh mm -hmm. man we're gonna to have to make a change that i can see for these reasons are already going to be unpopular and so you kind of like resist and then you get yourself into a different just trap you're like just we just have to do this like 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's just it's just important. I, I know this is going to be frustrating, but we just have to go through it. And, and you lose that chance to get that empathy. And it's fine that it's very common and natural to fall into that mindset. And it doesn't necessarily serve us well at all in the actual delivery of a change. Yeah, it definitely doesn't. And so a big thing that we always say in organizational change is asking for input, first of all, to start on, well, day zero, day negative three, whatever your your change start date, move it back to you had an idea. First thing you do is ask for input. First thing, before the idea goes anywhere is you share the idea with the people who are going to be impacted by the the change, because if they don't do what you're expecting them to do, the change is just an idea. It's just going to float away like a balloon you know, up to the sky. And so you involve. And input doesn't mean that you're changing your mind on your idea. Well, you're changing probably some, but input doesn't mean giving everybody what they want, that giving everybody any request that they have, even including we're not making the change what they want. Input means input. It means that now you have greater knowledge, greater curiosity over what's actually going to be happening, how we get to the change. And yes, some some change ideas in organizations and at home and in life, there are going to be ideas that we don't like. I wanted to go to my Starbucks. I didn't want a long line. Okay. I can resist that all day long and I can, I'm better off just either giving up my Starbucks or going to a different one. Um, yeah. And so I don't, I'm not changing the Starbucks and by making it so that everybody poof disappears just because that's what I want. But I can yeah. now go create my experience to get what I, you know, to go, get to my goal. Yes. Yeah, I think that's a great way of looking at that. And it's just difficult sometimes, I think, to, and to your point, you know, there's there's a fear and a resistance to going and asking for some of that input sometimes because you're worried you're like, if people have an idea, now you're going to have to accommodate that one too. And now mm-hmm. it's adding the complexity of the change in your head. And the the mental trap there is that the complexity is going to be there either way. Like mm-hmm. I, it's it's understandable to not want to add complexity to an already difficult process. Totally makes sense not to want to do that, and it's gonna be there whether be you like there. it or not. Like, <laughs> like the pants. Yes. Like, I, I yes. you don't want to ask about it for understandable reasons. We already have pants. I don't want to. I, I think it's gonna add extra time in an already busy schedule trying to get up to what is actually a pretty hard deadline. Of we have a flight ticket, so we're gonna have yes. to be like on on that one. There's there's going to be an end date on this. And it's understandable not to want to add that complexity. The problem is it's not you adding complexity. That complexity is already there. It's whether you're addressing Mm -hmm. it. Yeah, I love how you put that. Like I'm not adding the complexity by asking for input and co-creating the new experience with my son or co-creating the new experience with the employees and the teams. Uh, I'm actually addressing the complexity that was there, that's going to be there all along. It doesn't, that doesn't go away. And actually I'm saving time by addressing it sooner. How much time did I waste resisting the fact that I needed to go shopping for new pants for my son? I could have done it three weeks ago via Amazon. Now I got to drive somewhere and be in public. (laughs) Now I'm going to go see daylight for this. (laughs) No, and guaranteed buy your pants that are not going to fit and then drive back to return them. So yeah. I've added complexity and time to my own resistance to what I wanted to happen. Yeah. Now multiply and- this by in an organization by thousands of employees. You're talking about crippling productivity and performance and engagement and satisfaction and all those things that actually do impact the bottom line for years mm-hmm. when things are done badly. I mean, you can look at changes and you know, some of our fortune tellers pieces. It's like we can look at a change and how badly it's being done and dealt with. And we can predict basically how many years of lost productivity you're going to go through. I'm like, yeah, it's going to be at least three years. Three years later, I'm like, oh, look at that. That company doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. Which is also (laughs) like... The whole project has been scrapped. Or we have the new project that we just started, which is some variation (laughs) of that one because we didn't give it time. But it's, it's funny you say that too, because so often one of the stated goals of a change is greater efficiency, productivity, cost savings, whatever it is. All of those are different different versions of efficiency. If you're more productive, you're more efficient with your time. If you're more you know, cost savings, you're more efficient with your money, whatever it is. We're always looking for some kind of efficiency, productivity gain. And we are so easily and often sacrificing so much productivity and how we're trying to get to that. 
and sac- and not and not sacrificing just in like the because the change might be the right change, but in how we're delivering it, we're losing mm-hmm. people's uh, morale, we're losing their buy-in, we're losing their ability to feel like they can be a part of the future, or where that their opinion might matter, or whatever other thing is going to come up and have them resist this. That's going to go kill productivity in a totally different mm-hmm. way, which might mitigate the overall benefits of the change, if not make it worse. If you're not careful to go try and do this for with with good intention and have mm-hmm. the patience to let it play out. And knowing that like there's just times where like the initial reaction is going to be resistance and that's okay. You can expect it. And given enough time, people will start to come around and see which way is right. And and as long as you're really clear that this has to happen and here's how it's going to happen and here's what we need to do, then it's a lot easier to face those, those moments of, okay, so we do, we didn't get quite there yet. Here's what we need to do. I get why everybody's frustrated. We still need to make this change. So I want to reiterate mm-hmm. the importance of the why here and get that own personal patience and try and rework that empathy in. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. Yeah. So now if I think about our own journey with this podcast, you know, we get to talk about our our biggest, well, pet peeve seems like a small word, but our biggest triggers of change and how we go through it. And so if we want to get to, you know, we talked about the so what. That's another recent thing I read. The so what is like, here's all the consequences of ignoring these things or not doing them right. Now what? Now what do you do with this hopefully illuminating knowledge that we just provided? Yeah. And I want to call out one other thing too. You mentioned that like the complexity in an organization then becomes trying to do this at a scale of like potentially hundreds to thousands of people uh, that that are that are being affected by this. And yes, every individual will have a little bit different journey on that. So as a leader, that seems like, okay, well, I'm definitely adding complexity. I'm going to try and listen to a thousand voices. This is where they actually just read a McKinsey article that does a good job of describing like archetyping and, and coming up mm-hmm. with like, what are kind of groups of people and groups of ways they might be going through change. And we're going to be able to address every single thing that goes along the way. But as long as we continue to show up with some support and empathy and try our best to mm-hmm categorize into as as many as needed without having too many categories that it's like unwieldy getting to those categories and archetypes of people that will be going through the change helps you organize Mm -hmm. the messages for those ones Mm -hmm. decide what they might be going through and address those in a more piecemeal fashion rather than like okay that's way too much complexity let's go back to the all for one idea yeah definitely and i think that's where the slowly getting to the so what or the now what, whatever what we're in. But the the piece about, you know, not being able to listen to thousands of voices, definitely got it. Uh, archetyping. But if we look at the middle management layer, that's where leveraging your middle manager probably comes in as one of the most important things in change in, within an organization because they are close to what their teams are doing, hopefully. You know, and so they understand what the impact of the change is going to be on them. And they're going to be the ones that actually have the huge weight to get buy-in and to make the change possible on the on the receiving end. And so making sure that that group of people is on board, understands where we're going, has validated that they understand that we're going to the same place that everybody else is expecting them to be, and has the tools and the support to then be able to figure out how do we move our teams to that goal and has that buy-in. So the buy-in, I would say it's probably for the middle management is the most crucial buy-in that's needed. It's not at the senior level. Again, the senior level, 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 and I've been in that position. All you do is walk around and figure out what to change to fix things. That's your job. So I have buy-in on just change in general because I get to do that all day long. And so... <laughs> The buy-in is that, you know, is at the people that are doing the job, but even more importantly, at the middle managers who have to make that happen. It's up to them to make it happen. It's up to them to deal with the resistance and the lack of buy-in and the productivity gaps and the engagement lowering. It's up to them. And so make sure that you hear their voices. Uh, when I think about very successful changes, well, very is probably high board, but very successful changes. One of the most successful changes I've seen in a company you know, the middle management layer was present at the sales at the sales meetings. They were present from day zero on the decisions made about the change because their opinions not only mattered, 
And some of them were not happy, but they still bought in to trying and figuring it out. But because it was their opinion, it was their way of looking at the world that was the most important way to understand which software do we move to, which processes do we need to change. I don't know as a VP of whatever, you know. And so let's make life easy for you, not me. <laughs> which will make life easy for you. Yes. <laughs> just which to, makes just life for, easy for you me. still will get that. <laughs> Unless I'm a firefighter and I'm going to create fires just for the hell of it. But it's a whole it's different a podcast. Firefighter arsonist. <laughs> firefighter arsonist. That's a great way of looking at it. I think there's just, we, we can make things easier on ourselves by getting some of that buy-in. And, and honestly, we're going to make for more successful changes because as great an idea as we can think of it. And, and since we are humans, we're going to have the immediate confirmation bias. If I thought of this, it seems like it addresses this. Great. Let's absolutely go do this idea. Like we can we even feel it. Like, and then we can start to get defensive of like, no, that's that was the idea. We shouldn't make be straying from this when people have ideas or input or or suggest like potential issues with that implementation of that idea or or trying to discern a better way to do this. There can be some frustration of like, no, no, this is this is the idea. The idea was originally doing this. So it takes a lot more diligence in ourselves to be curious and open to the change and be ready for like that to be a little bit different. And that takes that input as well as not feeling like we have the answer. So ultimately, we don't. We never will. We never will have the full answer. And we're going to get a lot better team cohesion and people taking ownership and all the other things that we love to throw out as buzzwords that we like our, we'd like to see our teams do if we do involve them more and we give them the chance to be empowered. It's one of the few ways we're going to have them actually be an empowered team. Indeed. So now we're in the now what? So now what? So that's a, that's a great exercise that you're talking about. Like, okay, we're doing this. So so what? So then what? So now what? All right. So, yes. now, so what do we want to accomplish? We wanted to be able to talk about some of the change traps. And so what do you what do we do with this knowledge? What's the now mm-hmm. that? I have a couple of ideas, but do you have anywhere you want to start on that? Oh, go ahead. All right. Thinking of now that we go back to as as comes up so often in this podcast, the importance of empathy, the importance yes. of just getting into an empathetic space, as well as getting more aware of the times where we are not going to mm-hmm. access that empathy and getting more aware of the times where it will be easy to fall out of that, to not be curious, to not get the input and to find reasons and excuses. And they're, they're legitimate thoughts and reactions and feelings that we will have that will tell us not to do this in an empathetic or slower or digestible way. So we really have a chance now. Now we have a chance to get that awareness, use that awareness and make a different choice and try and be more aware when that's happening as it will naturally kind of slip into our subconsciouses anyway. Yeah, that's a, that's a definitely a great one. So, you know, pick, pick up that mirror, walk into the mirror room, look around and look at yourselves and figure out like what what is it, what am i attached to so figure out like what what is it that i'm expecting this to happen what's that experience do i want to move on to the next change is that why i'm rushing this what am i attached to here and typically that will then illuminate where the empathy was lacking do i actually understand what people's experience of this is do i actually understand what they're going to have to go through to get to the end the end that I've established, and then having the humility of realizing maybe that end is not where we need to go. Maybe my mm-hmm. idea of that end, getting the input, maybe will illuminate the fact that, oh, yeah, that's not going to get me to where I thought was going to get me, hence pants on legs. You know, mm-hmm. minimizing my son's experience with his pants was not going to get me to be able to pack pants and be happy on vacation. And so... Maybe I need to change what my why is. Yeah, no, I really like that. That's a great example of like what, how to get back into these mindsets. Because the, but as we've talked about, like the, the cost is going to be exacted on you either way. The, the cost of time or the cost of resistance or the cost of seemingly added complexity. The complexity is already there. The mm-hmm. cost is already there. Like if you want to make this change, that's it's going to, it, that has that price tag. And we can try and mark it down. We can try and act like we only have to pay this much right now, but the cost is going to change. Mm-hmm. The change is going to cost the yeah. same in the end. And so knowing that and knowing that that helps us get more focused on when, when is it the right time to make a change and a push mm-hmm. when, because we will have to go through the full cost of all of the resistance of all the time of all the extra effort that we know we need to get through is going to happen whether we try and force it or whether we try and do it slowly 
but one one way gives our team more uh influence and one way ends up breaking down the trust and making it even harder the next time we want to go make a change and so knowing that that cost is going to happen either way we can, helps us stay focused on the eventual why and find more creative ways to get to that instead of mm-hmm. saying this is the why and i i i, I, I just want to say I, I have empathized entirely with not wanting to go do this or feeling like oh my god mm-hmm. i don't i'm exhausted i don't have the time to do this i get it that's also what some of your people are feeling that's like, it's just what happens it's okay to feel that way and it doesn't change the fact that the reality of change will still be chaos and there will still be some yeah. some changes we have to make and we still have to get that buy in we still have to address people more individually all of those are going to be there either way yeah so i would say yeah the the if there's a secret formula, the secret formula of the, the now, what do I do with all this information is, well, you know, stretch your empathy, curiosity, and humility muscles. Because that's that's really what's going to get the change to be successful. And you will get there faster. Because, mm-hmm. again, like if you have, if you actually establish a, a good end of the change deadline, you will realize that you're going to get there faster by involving humility, empathy, and curiosity as the way to look at the change and deal with the whole change. The the fake end of change, the go live, that's not the end. Not if you then have two years of re-implementing, reconfiguring, and customer support and people mm-hmm. not using the platform. That's yeah. not the end of the change. The end of the change is when that status quo is fully adopted. Yeah. That's it. And even if that feels like that's going to take a long time, you make an important point that it, it will be faster for one. And then not only is it faster on this change, you're buying time in the future. You create yes. that kind of trust. You create that kind of process. You create the kind of awareness that everybody should be looking at what else belongs in this change. Who else do I need to talk to? It's okay to talk about that. It's okay for this to be slow. It's okay to have resistance. And here's what we still want to do. And we still want to refocus on our purpose. The more you've really got that to ingrain more and more in the culture, leading by example and pushing that more and more out, the more you buy yourself time and future changes, there will still be resistance, but you're buying yourself a, a team that is trusting you, mm-hmm. able to give you the right input way faster and trusting yes. that like you have a good reason for your changes and they're ready to follow you on the next one because you will have to make a next one. It's fine. It's, it's fine to always have to be changing. We do have to adjust things constantly mm-hmm. and we can buy ourselves a lot less resistance in doing it if we build that trust over time, even though it can come in short and painful steps occasionally. Yeah, 100%. Human-led change will pay dividends in shorter time in the long run. It's a long game. It's not a short game. Yeah. Because they, and, and the, the way to remember that and to feel like, well, I don't have the time to make the time for that right now is that the time's going to be made for you either way. Oh, yeah. It's going <laughs> to cost you one way or another. So you can, you can choose to not do this the right way. You're kind of incurring an extra tax. It's like tech debt. It's just you, you start with yeah. Here's a few things we missed. Okay, mm-hmm. but now that's an extra 3% on the next sprint. That's an extra 4% yes. on the next sprint. Like, here's okay. where this starts to add up over time. And so, even though it is painful, really mm-hmm. addressing that up front will pay you dividends in the long term. And you get more comfortable with doing that, at which point it doesn't even feel like it's as much of a tax in the first place to go pay the, pay the piper up front, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, now I have to hire a whole dedicated team to go finish the project that was never finished because we declared the finish when it wasn't supposed to be finished. So there's a lot of cost. The cost is enormous. Yeah. So have some empathy, but not just for everyone else. Also have some empathy for yourself. This Mm -hmm. is not going to be an easy thing to do all the time. This is going to feel like it can get slowed down. There's a thousand reasons that feel very natural and correct to have resistance in yourself to doing and taking some of this more time, uh, seemingly more um, time expensive approach up front but there are dividends to be paid in the long run, both for you and for other people. And have some empathy for yourself going through this because change is also hard for you. It's hard for everybody. Empathy, curiosity, and humility all around.